Thanks, Julian. So we're going to do one audience question and then uh, jump into the kind of like episode portion. And I picked one question it's up here on on the screen. Which That's a good is, one. Why are there not more Stanford students? And I assume you're you work you're a prof at Harvard, so we can also uh, expand that to Harvard. Why are there yeah, not top more Stanford and Harvard students in sales? Yeah, I, I got my MIT, uh, MBA from MIT. I teach at Harvard. I've done some lectures at Stanford, and like, yeah, it's not common. Um, hmm. I think it's because sales has a bad reputation, um, as kind of historically, it's been left to your like, like we're the MBAs are in the executive suite, and like the the lower IQ folks are out in the streets, you know, hawking the product. Um, but we're going through some big changes in sales. And um, I know we'll talk about that a little bit as we go on. And uh, there's a lot of sales roles out there. In fact, I think there's a growing amount of sales roles that um, the, the high IQ and the business acumen and the strategic sense that you develop in a top MBA makes you uh, quite advantageous as a, a successful and unique seller. And the type of sales that um could be executed for some by someone that you know cares less about the buyer and more about just like lying and manipulating and that kind of stuff that's becoming a bit of a dinosaur uh so i think it's changing i would say like a ton of my students every year go and carry a quota and it's increasing all the time i've hired even at hubspot i hired half a dozen or more hbs mbas that are now are running 300 person sales teams they're running companies and it's uh, it's quite a place to land initially. If you can carry a quota for two years and you have an MBA, wow, you're uh, you've laid a great foundation for your career. If you were a like a student at Stanford or Harvard or whatever, um, and say like an undergrad, and you sure. wanted to get a job in in sales, uh, where like where would you go? Like where would you? Yeah. Because like you don't want to like you want to presumably you want to work with people who are, you know, who see eye to eye with you and have mm -hmm. like a similar kind of like approach. So like how if you were sort of Princeton undergrad or Harvard undergrad mm -hmm. and you said okay I think there's like an opportunity to become a seller and I'm going to be in demand, where would you how would you do that? Yeah, I've asked that. I've answered that question quite a bit, and actually studied over about eight years of, of teaching at Harvard and watching students go that way, and even undergrad. Fine. Um, there's two dimensions I'd look at. Number one is um, if the organization has successfully taken like an Ivy League degree uh, graduate and turned them into sellers, maybe even have some Ivy League alumni in the sales executive org. That's a very very promising sign because they. They, you know, even for myself, like when I, I hired a couple of MIT and Harvard grads who'd never sold before, and I hired a couple of like, you know, 25 year old Oracle salespeople, um, and they both had ramp to do to be successful at HubSpot, but the ramp was very different, you know. So, so there's there, if you can find someone that an organization that has already done that. You're not the first Ivy Leaguer who's never sold before to come in, um, but there's already an alumni base and there's a success track record. That's a huge sign. Um, the second thing I would look for is, you know, there are a lot of sales roles out there that you, you want to be selling complex stuff to sophisticated people. You don't want to be selling like, like stuff to blue collar frontline people, right? That, that's just going to become, that's a sales role. There's a successful companies there, but that's not a great sales role for like an Ivy leaguer who probably wants to be more intellectually stimulated. You want to be selling like complex business intelligence software to like fortune 500 C-suite executives. Like there's not a lot of salespeople that can hang there. And um, it requires much more than just pure sales training, right? So just like that, those are the, the lenses I typically like to look at. So instead of working at, you know, selling, uh, say like 
chef's attire to uh, hotels do you want to you know work at HubSpot? Yeah, HubSpot to some degree, but even like a lot of our sales at HubSpot was selling like you know it's blogging like capability stuff. for plumbers. You know, like I wouldn't want an Ivy Leaguer to end up there. I want them to end up on like like the channel sales team, where they're working with an agency on refining their business model. That's complicated stuff. Or work on the enterprise team, where we're trying to close like you know a twenty thousand person organization. Like they're not going to get there at twenty two, but that's where I want to kind of head them toward where it will be a little more stimulating and a better fit for them long term. And okay. And like, do you know, uh, so we have uh, most of our audience are actually um, Ivy League students. Um, we have like a ton of them who uh, watch us. And uh, where, like, if they wanted to get a job right now or kind of explore a job or get an internship or whatever, like, what's a specific company you'd recommend or a specific sales leader you'd recommend right now? Yeah, I mean, a big example, a good buddy is in LinkedIn, Dan Shapiro. Um, he's COO right now. He came up through the sales org. I think he spent like 15 years there. He is an H Harvard grad um, and they've hired tons of Ivy Leaguers. Um, so that's one that comes to mind and there's plenty of others um, that you could you could find like that. Okay, so thank you. That was super insightful, um, obviously. So what I'm going to do is uh, kind of like introduce you, and this will be the part that yeah. we'll edit down for the uh, sure. uh, republished. So, um, okay. so we're joined by Mark Roberge. Mark is the most sought after sales leader uh, in the world. He's a venture capital uh, investor at Stage Two Capital, Profit Harvard, MIT grad, former chief revenue officer at HubSpot, and uh, welcome, Mark. Thanks, Julian. So your name always comes up when people talk about PLG. We actually did an interview with uh, Mike Brown from uh, Bowery, and uh, he was kind of mentioned PLG, and he mentioned you. And um, here we'll, we'll assume that the audience knows you know what PLG is, uh, and um, the question is, what is the new customer behavior that makes PLG relevant today in a way that it wasn't before? Um, I would say comfort with like self-researching and adopting of software. Um, you know, I think that would be a big thing. I think people kind of wanted to like hear from a person. And I think now people are a little more like, I'd rather just be up on a Saturday night at 10 o'clock and the kids are in bed and I just want to like, research a problem and maybe tinker around with some stuff, especially if, if you're like a little more technical. Um, I think people who gravitate toward like younger generations or like grew up doing this, like anytime my kids have a question, they just go on YouTube and like figure it out, you know? So I think we're moving in that direction. And that's what's really exciting about PLG is um, any disruption that starts with buyer behavior is extremely powerful. And it's just really logical to me. It doesn't apply to every sector, but like, in general, if someone had two choices and one choice is um, one vendor, I can like go to the website, request a demo, talk to a salesperson, look at a demo, decide if I want to sign a contract, buy it, and then adopt it. And another vendor is like, I can just click a button, use it, see if it works, and then buy it if it works. I mean, that's just so obvious. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean that you can do that in everything. You can't buy like a an HR benefit system like that. Um, but there are a lot of segments where you can, and that's that's one of many reasons why PLG is, ex is an exciting disruptive model. What do you say that it's, so, so you use the word comfort with that, that, and why do you use that term instead of like, let's say, irritation with needing to meet salespeople in in person one of the things i noticed uh you know let's say when i started my first business versus now is i feel my customers just don't want to talk to me um and don't want to meet me in person uh in a way that was not true uh, i guess six years ago um 
do you find that's like i'll let you riff off that mm, sure yeah i think there's different levels of that go back a while like there's one that goes back decades where um i do think that the sales profession got a very bad reputation because of salespeople, and they they were like a necessary gate to you buying stuff and they abuse that power uh, by manipulating lying um you know using all these trickeries that that goes away you know in a, in a day and age where you can buy something and find out that you're tricked and go online and and give it a one star and tell everybody like you're cook and so is the salesperson so that was one level that and now julian i think what you're feeling is i think something triggered by covid honestly you know i think like we we were a little slow to um get out of our comfort zone on more efficient uh ways to do business or just we're on our lives to be honest with you but in this case just do business uh, a classic example was like um you know there's a lot of enterprise sales people out there who are like i just can't like if if a if a customer in london needs to see me like i need to go i need to go and shake that hand and like make sure we get that deal and now you know after two and a half years of not being able to do that because of covid and having to do it over the phone both the buyer and the seller are like i don't really think we need to just this is go on zoom right so it's like first off no one even knew how to use like you know what a lot of people didn't know how to use like video technology most people didn't know how to turn on their their video you know like now everyone does so there's been a technical we like required training and then I think like in hindsight now people have a much more realistic lens on the ROI of their time and when that meeting is is needed. And do you think so let's say in a in a complex sales organization, there's a or a complex organization, right? And you're selling into, you know, the, the type of businesses we were talking about before. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that people are more distributed now. So they're not all in the kind of like New York HQ and getting everybody in the same room physically is totally impossible. Cause you know, you have like a guy in Singapore, a guy in London, a guy in Montana. And how, how does that kind of like asynchronous nature of, uh, of, of uh, decision-making for the buyers, how does that influence the need for PLG? Hmm. I've never been asked to me that way before. <laughs> That's a very complex question. Because I think, like, um, I'm not sure that that complexity of getting everyone together is um, <clears throat> is that new. You know, I think there have been a lot of like complex sales environments where you have multinational organizations and like, it's like, okay, now we have to get like the, you know, the general manager of North America, Europe and Asia in a room. To, and it's just like, that was three months just to get the meeting going. So it really slowed things down. And now they're fine, like, you know, getting on a Zoom and it just accelerates things quite a bit. Um, so just in general in sales, I think that's helpful that people are comfortable. Like I don't, I don't need to actually meet in person, et cetera, to make that happen. Now, PLG wise. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I just think it's, um, I might answer your question a little different. Like closing complex deals. How does PLG impact closing more complex deals, like more enterprise? And, um, it just allows you to take a, to complement the traditional tops down sales approach, which was like call into power, build champions, you know, create use case, you know, create ROIs, you know, get IT's buy in, talk to procurement. These are the processes we work together. Complement that with a bottoms up approach as well. And perhaps even use the bottoms up to decide which accounts are most qualified to invest in. Okay, so I don't think there's, I mean, hey, listening to this podcast, like if you've expanded an account to be a million dollar deal exclusively through PLG, 
Like, can you please comment that? <laughs> I think we should like learn about that because I'd have never heard of one. Like, I don't, I don't think anyone's, maybe they have. Um, um, I don't know. But it's more like, usually it's kind of like, okay, you know, you got this 50,000 person company and, you know, all of a sudden like some frontline worker discovered some tool from their roommate or whatever, started using it. And then they talked about it with their other peer. And then before you know it, they were like 400 people at the company using this thing. Well, that in a, in a good PLG company, that would trigger an alert to the enterprise sales team that like, hey, if you're not already working this account, someone probably should. Or if you are working this account, you should use this like, you know, bottoms up movement that's happening as like collateral to engage with your champions even further. And so that's that's really, I think, the the addition that PLG brings to more complex enterprise selling is I don't think you go from zero million through PLG, but it does offer additional trigger events to get in and conversation points as you're working the account from the top down. Okay, so if you are a software engineer today, um, so you're 21, you're, you know, you just love building. Um, and what does PLG mean for you? Like, is there a strong case that you should explore going into, you know, selling or being as a, as a developer. Like a, yeah. Like, is that kind of like a track that you should be focused on and how, and what, what, what does it, what does it mean to you? Yeah. I don't think so. You shouldn't be coming sales. Like um, if we look at the org structure overall uh, and what PLG does um, PLG really lives in the growth team. And I actually have an entire course at HPS that I created around this team. Um, and I'm very fortunate that like, I kind of, even though I run the course partially in Silicon Valley, which is cool. So we get to kind of watch these, these companies with who have these growth teams. Now growth teams is one of those words that like means everything today. Like they, some people name their sales team growth teams. They call their marketing team growth teams. What I mean by a growth team is, and I think this is the pure, the, the pure people that like really run PLG and X agree, they own the self-serve funnel, right? So when you have PLG, it means you have this self-serve funnel, meaning you can go to the website, you can activate a free account, you can start using the account, and oftentimes you can like use it to a point where you hit a paywall and you convert into a paid customer. That's like a self-serve funnel. That's what the growth team owns, is they're just trying to get as many people to activate the account and they're really ex running lots of experiments to maximize how many activate people become a retained free user and how many retained free users become a paid user and how many paid users or free users tell their friends and, and drive the viral coefficient. That's what they're good at. And so if you're an, a developer, that's awesome. You should explore that team to see if it's a fit for you. Now, where the best companies, the best PLG companies do is they put the growth team in product. And so product, product and engineering, right? So product is segmented into two groups, core product and growth. So core product runs the, like what we typically think of as product engineering. They run the roadmap. It's like, this is, this is what we intend to build this quarter, this year. And there's engineers that are like running sprints and, you know, doing their every two week work, you know, assignments and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a different team that runs growth. And that has a product manager, a couple like full stack engineers, some designers, some data scientists, maybe a marketer, could have a customer success person on it. Those really cross functional, it's fun. And typically like the, the R and D um, resources on that team um, are, are a little different than the R&D resources on core product. Like the engine, like some engineers have a preference to be in core product versus growth. Like if you, if you just like to like kind of know what you're building and you kind of want to know that that's kind of like what you're going to build for the next month and you want to write really efficient, clean code and all that kind of stuff, 
like you probably should be in core product. But if you like to like work with a cross-functional team and every day you're going to run an experiment and learn something and it's really fast and you're like building on your knowledge of this of the overall funnel and, and the user like that's exciting for some people and that's what more like an engineer or a designer would look like in growth so so that's how it looks like in the organization so if you're a developer you don't have to go on a sales to explore this stuff you're you're actually a key part the way the sales team fits in is there are some people that enter the PLG funnel that are never like accounts that enter into it that are never going to get to the potential revenue that that account has without people. They're never going to like expand themselves into a million dollar account, might even expand themselves into a $20,000 account. And that's where like companies are really good at like knowing, oh, this is a really small account. Let's just keep them in the free, free funnel, the free, the, the humanless funnel. But this is actually a, a, a mid-market account. Let's put this over to the mid-market team. And that's called a product qualified lead. And so that gets assigned to that. Team. And then, oh, this is an enterprise one. The enterprise team probably is running named accounts. And let's just notify them that something happens so that whoever owns that account knows that there's an event that happened. So sales is almost a little more t outside of the PLG funnel than a developer would be on the growth team. So if you're you know, a developer listening here and you say, hey, what Mark just described uh, as being as being like, you know, being part of like the sort of non-core product, right? So the growth team, that's really, really appealing to me. Where would you go to you know, know more about that and, mm -hmm. um, you know, see people who are just like top notch. Cause my impression mm -hmm. is when I speak to, to like, you know, junior developers is they don't realize that they are one of the most important assets for growth, uh, and for go to market. Uh, and yep. how, how can they like, nerd out on that who who are mm -hmm. good thought leaders who are sure. people who are leading in that yeah um so yeah and i i would i think that's an important question julian because i feel like every year the plg movement grows quite a bit and there's such a deficiency as that growth happens there's more and more demand for people who have experience in it and there's a huge like a growing gap of of you know demand for that and supply of that talent. So if you're young, I think it's a beautiful place to start. Um, the number one place I'd go is the Reforge School, R-E-F-O-R-G-E. -E. Uh, it's founded by uh, this gentleman, Brian Balfour, who I've known for decades. And I was fortunate to, uh, during our relationship, I recruited him to join me at HubSpot to build our growth function when we moved into the sales software arena. We wanted to do it through a PLG uh, arena and a, a model, and we didn't really have the know-how internally on how to do PLG. So we wanted to bring him in, and we, 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 I got to work um, side by side with him for a couple of years where I, I really laid the foundation for my knowledge of the space. And after he left, he went off and started the Reforge School to basically be like a, a new age tech, ed tech play to help educate the next generation of you know, PLG and growth leaders. So on the consumer side, they don't really talk about as PLG, they talk about more as growth. And on the B2B side, they talk about a PLG. So that's a really good starting point because he lists off a lot of his alumni and a lot of his instructors. And of course, you can go into LinkedIn and just do a Google search for like Reforge alumni. And the companies that uh, Reforge alumni are at or the where the leaders are from is probably a strong correlation to companies that really know what they're doing. Uh, with regard to uh, PLG and growth. So, you know, I, I can tell you off the top of my head, you know, and especially people that I've worked with in my class, you know, companies that do it well are like um, uh, Pinterest, um, Lyft, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Shopify, um, Airbnb, Uber, um, you know, th those are those are some of the companies that do it well. Cool. Is this so, so insightful. I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to push you to answer questions you wouldn't have answered on other podcasts because you're such <laughs> a deep expert and everyone always asks you the same questions. No, these are good. There's a lot of them that I, that I haven't. 
So final question, because uh, we're, we're nearing the end, which is what does PLG mean for an entrepreneur who's starting a business and who's kind of like, you know, ideation stage? Like, yeah. should you be, really, I think what it comes down to is like, should you be shying away from businesses that where you can't have a PLG motion on the B2B side? And, you know, in what cases, how would you structure your thinking around that? Yeah, I wouldn't shy away from businesses where you can't have PLG, you know, because like if you're passionate about the business, like that's great. There's a ton in the next decade, there's going to be a bunch of IPOs of non-PLG companies that are going to be tens of billion dollars of companies. That, uh, that's awesome. Um, there's just certain use cases where you PLG doesn't apply and doesn't mean it's not a great business. And so <clears throat> I wouldn't shy away from it, but I might reframe your question, Julian. If you are starting out, what you do have to do is make sure you have thought very hard about whether PLG applies. Um, just because um, if you start the business and start making progress and you do it through a sales-led growth approach as opposed to a PLG approach, and you scale to 100,000 and a million and $2 million. And then you realize that your business actually PLG applies to, it's extremely hard to transition to it. It's extremely hard. And we can like, it's just primarily hard because like, you're going to have to make a hard call of making a portion of your product free that will likely cannibalize your existing install base. People who are you paying you a thousand a year or five thousand a year will just choose to pay you a lot less, and that's a necessary call to pursue the PLG model at that point, and that's a very tough call because when you're a million dollar company going to a two million dollar company and then you make this call and you go back to a million dollar company, that's just hard. It's hard to raise money off of, so it's it's. It's much like you got to do a lot of thinking about is PLG applicable? And it, if you feel like it might be, you really got to start there. And if you start there and then you discover that PLG is not applicable, you're still in a very good spot because essentially what you did was you built a product, you gave it away for free initially with maybe some sort of monetization tier. And then you discover that it's just people aren't like adopting it humanlessly. They're not upgrading humanlessly. And you worked at it, worked at it, ran a bunch of it. Just realized that it's not possible. We did that at HubSpot. Like it wasn't possible with our marketing software to PLG. It was like you got to blog for four months and then your leads go up. It wasn't a PLG opportunity. But if you start there and you realize that all you end up with is a very easy to use product that you can now transition to sales led growth, and that's great, right? So, so that's the thing you have to be careful about. And I wrote a blog article. If you if you Google my name and like. How do you know if your category is PLGable? You'll you'll see my thinking on that today. That'll that because that's a critical decision at the at the beginning is should you even try it. And uh, final uh, question. Well, to wrap this up, where can people find you? Um, you have a blog, I assume Twitter and LinkedIn. Where what, what's the best place for people to get more uh, Mark repairs? Yeah, we we blog very actively on Stage Two Capital's website. Uh, stage two dot capital, and then I'm very active on I'm most active on LinkedIn. I try to be active everywhere, but I'm I'm most active on LinkedIn. If you want to ping me there. Well, uh, Mark, thank you for the time. Thank you for everyone who submitted questions, um, and mostly thank you to our producer Jeremy and our head of content uh, Shlok, who made all this uh, possible. Thanks, Julian. Bye. I will uh, end the.